Frank and Bali, how are you doing? Excellent, Sean. How are you? I'm 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 doing well. Uh, you know, as I was saying just before we started rolling, you're like a uh, a real life guitar hero of mine. Uh, this is uh, very kind of uh, you to say. Yeah, I have to like pinch myself a little bit to make sure I'm still awake here. Um, <laughs> Late there or something? What time is it? Oh no no no! <laughs> well, well, the expression is is maybe I'm dreaming, you know. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. pinch yourself, then it's like, oh, I'm not dreaming. It's it's really happening. Yeah. Well, the best thing is being in dreams awake, for sure. Ah. A dream reflected on my guitar. That's pretty cool. Hey, yeah. Why not keep it pointing in that direction? <laughs> I'll just probably put it down for a second and we can always just chat so so uh so what got you playing guitar like wh where um and, and who were some of your earliest teachers um you know i grew up in australia so you know there wasn't a lot around for me to to latch on to uh, other than records so i was just really learning stuff off of records and uh, you know i had two older brothers that were into it so uh, i just wanted to be like them and so i was just at a very young age like six or seven i started playing so it's you know it's 175 years ago it's uh, you know a lot of a lot of time and water under the bridge and my earliest influences were typical you know i always say influences are uh, always chronological you know you know the things i listen to then are, are stuff that i you know i i tap into every now and then being nostalgic but uh, you know your your tastes change as you evolve as a musician and then therefore uh Get the people you're listening to change as well you know a lot of people uh, you know i've seen in in print media back in the day when most people would just say oh i was influenced by Jimi hendrix and eric clapton and that was like the first eight years of my life you know <laughs> and then it went on to a uh, uh, you know a whole list of others you know from mike brecht brecker to chick Corea to you know Jean Luc ponty's music and george duke's music and earthman of fire and steely dan i could go on and on and on and on with uh, the names of uh, musicians that have uh, and groups that have in uh, interested and inspired me so you know so you can't just say who are your early influences. They're they're just the ones that uh, gave you the spark to want to play. And for sure, Hendrix gave me the spark to want to play. You know, I thought, man, listen to all that stuff coming out of a guitar. You know, <laughs> you listen to Star Spangled Banner, uh, that live Woodstock, and you just go, holy shit! Yeah. Am I allowed to swear? Sorry, <laughs> say Holy, uh, say. moly, it's incredible. Uh, you know, just, <laughs> just coming out of a guitar, love the guitar, I'm still crazy about the guitar, you know, it, it makes all kinds of sounds, huh? Oh, we've got a yeah. bit of a delay going on, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it was, it was frozen for just a second, but it's, it's back, everything's good. Okay. Um, so. So how influenced have you been by other instruments? And the reason I'm asking you this mm -hmm. is that, uh, so your, uh, so the uh, sweet picking in all of this stuff that you do with it. I mean, most, most sweet, uh, you know, sweeping like metal sweeping is like arpeggios or something, you know, mm -hmm. stuff to, so that you can play in one position, but you've taken this thing and you have gone, uh, all over the place and you play all this stuff that's not really supposed to be possible to play on guitar right. um, but but it's like easy <laughs> but i mean well um, it's easy uh to look at <laughs> it's not easy to do it yeah look you know um uh you know i there's a lot of controversy over this i would you know i was claiming to be the originator of this technique you know and, you know, much to the uh, chagrin of a lot of people out there saying, oh, well, you know, Les Paul did, mm, and, uh, you know, Charlie Christian did, mm, and, uh, you know, sure. I mean, that's like, um, 
a, a basic little flurry, you know, which is obvious. Uh, what is less obvious is making entire phrases that cover the entire fretboard or, you know, the minutiae of, uh, of sweeping where you're just sweeping across two strings, you know, even something as simple as that. You know, those kind of movements were never done before me, you know. And so uh, a good friend of mine, Jude Gold, who, um, you know, was, I consider a, a pretty strong authority because he, he was editor of Guitar Player magazine. He was also head of the Musicians Institute, the guitar department, uh, for many years, too. Um, you know, it's somebody whose who's, uh, opinion I, I value. And he said to me, Frank, why don't you just call it Gambali sweep picking? Then nobody can say anything, right? <laughs> so now I just call it, this is what I do with it. This is Gambali sweep picking. And so there ends the controversy. Uh, I invented Gambali sweep picking, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and I've taken it to the moon. Yeah, you're right. It was, um, you know, it was something that seemed so logical to me. You know, having three strings adjacent is no, there's absolutely no point to alternate. You would just go straight across. And it's incredibly fast. If you want it to be, I, I consider this technique in most cases, uh, uh, in two ways, I consider it as like fifth or sixth gear in a nice new BMW, you know, eight series. Uh, it gives you that incredible speed, but you're still relaxed, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I also see it as, um, and just as importantly, uh, as a way to get out of technical uh, issues with the guitar, roadblocks, you know, things that are uh, unusual or, you know, may hang up your right hand while you're picking. You know, right. so I always, the beautiful thing about guitars is so many notes that are the, exactly the same. So you can always find, it's like I can always find a side street around a roadblock, you know what I mean? If I'm having a tough, if I've got a tough phrase, I mean, you know, I'll find a way around it uh, using my sweep uh, thoughts, you know, how I would, you know, get out of a problem, problematic situation and make it playable and make it fun and make it less painful or, you know, or less of an obstacle. Yeah. And that's important, you know. I mean, guitar is hard enough as it is. You know, uh, I'm always going to look for the easiest way to play something. And that doesn't mean I'm lazy. I'm just wanting to be incredibly efficient with uh, using the technique. And I never put the cart before the horse. To me, the technique always came second to music. If I was, you know, learning a complex phrase, you know, or something, or copying a solo from Mike Brecker or Chick, you know, that were instruments that, yeah, like you mentioned, they weren't, they're not guitar. So we don't have uh, a predetermined uh, way to play it, you know. If I listen to a guitar player, I know what finger they're using on what string just from listening. That's how familiar I am with guitar, you know, after 50 something years. So, you know, but if I'm, I'm transcribing Chick and as a piano solo, it's open season. I can figure, I got to figure out a way to play it somehow. And there's no pre predetermined way to play it. So this led me in all kinds of directions that were new, you know, uh, just simply because I wanted to play a complex phrase. It was very difficult, but uh, I wanted to be able to play it. It was musically satisfying to me. So, you know, just because something um, uh, is musical and, and complex doesn't mean that it's easy to play. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, right. it was a, a challenge. So I found a way to play challenging things, you know, and I got out of most, uh, in fact, every roadblock I was able to get around by finding a, a way to sweep something. So I have this, uh, I, I did this uh, now, now, so you know a little bit, um, uh, uh, I'm the director of jazz studies at Ohio State, 
and I am. Thank you so much for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. State, and I am a, a professor of jazz saxophone. So my first instrument is saxophone, um, but I also play uh, guitar. Uh, I play bass, and uh, and the, because of this sort of. Uh, you know, my, the way my mind works, I'm always interested in how things sort of connect. You know, how does saxophone relate to guitar? How does saxophone relate to bass and 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 whatnot? Um, and so I had this idea, and I I, I presented this this uh, research project, and it's called Train and Guitar, as in. Coltrane and guitar, the effect of John Coltrane on plectrum mechanics, and it's it's yeah. So it's been my contention. So I'll, I'll read you a little bit of the of the first part. So at the 42nd annual Grammy Awards, Carlos Santana accepted the award for Album of the Year by saying, "Long live John Coltrane." That got me thinking, why would a pop guitar player be giving homage to John Coltrane? Well, John Coltrane has had a profound influence on all jazz-influenced music, in addition to the influence on other saxophone players like Chris Potter, Michael Brecker, Donnie McCaslin, just keep naming saxophones, mm -hmm. Sean Wallace, every, you know, um, uh, and etc. He's also had a tremendous influence on all instrumentalists, from Herbie Hancock, Freddie Hubbard, Willie Shaw, Conrad Herwig and John Patitucci and uh, guitarists like Frank Gambale, <laughs> Alan Holdsworth, Eddie Van Halen, and Carlos Santana. And then I I started going down and I started speculating. Of course, this is just speculation. I, now I can sort of uh, ask you directly, and this is part of the reason why I asked you about some of your influences. Um, and uh, did uh, with the with the sweet picking was that uh, an approach to try to be able to access stuff that you heard on other instruments, or was it just stuff that you were just hearing that you were uh, that you needed to develop a a concept to be able to to access? Uh, well, you know, honestly, I would have to say it's a combination of the, okay, yeah. two of those things because. Yeah, look, I was listening to Horn a lot, uh, you know, and Coltrane and Brecker and and Chick and a whole host of other uh, players, too, that, uh, you know, uh, you know, on a saxophone, you've got that octave switch with your thumb you, and your fingerings essentially stay the same. Right. Am I correct in saying that? There, there are there are several fingers fingerings in common. Yes. Right. So if you're doing a two octave arpeggio, you don't have to uh, really get out of position too much, although your hands are pretty much in the same position right, right. all the time. But mm -hmm. to do that on the guitar is is really a lot harder. You know, you have to span across a couple octaves, which is never easy with the right hand for for the pick. Traditional shapes uh, that we all saw in the in the textbooks were, you know, like a major seven was always this which was a single hand position for the left hand. But for the right hand, is a total disaster. You can't play it at all. I can't at any kind of speed. Yeah. So, you know, something had to change, you know. So I did a lot of thinking on my own just in terms of, you know, what are the roadblocks here? This is not working. This is a traditional shape, but it's not working for me. I can't play it faster and smoother. So, uh, and the startling thing for me was that I only changed the position of a single note and the floodgates opened really tremendously. You know, this part was okay. I could, I skip a note. So I, I broke a few rules. I don't go. There isn't three notes on top. I just skip one. 
And I decided that I would put this G over here. Like I said before, there's similar notes all over the place on the guitar. So, so I would be able to sweep across three strings with a single stroke. And I had three notes on the D string to get me back to that original position. And the result is, It's crazy, you know, right? So if I compare this to a standard alternate picking, alternate would have been 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 picking strokes. I do it in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you can clearly see the efficiency uh, of that, right? Uh, it's so logical and efficient. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I was learning a lot from other instruments and that, that was a different kind of challenge. You know, I remember an arpeggio chick used to play on. Uh, oh shit, I can't even play. Uh, I just not am, I'm not comfortable with this right now. That's basically the arpeggio. It's fourths, basically. And he just rips it with two hands, a little long, you know. Right. I thought, how the heck am I going to play that? So I found a way to sweep it where I go three notes down, one up, and then cross back down, four notes down, up a whole step with the whole thing. Arpeggio, you know, it was a lot of work to uh, to work it up as an exercise, and it's, but it was truly worth it, you know. And so, there's no other way that I could find to play that uh, arpeggio yeah, yeah, I mean, without sweeping, you know. Yeah, right, certainly with alternate <clears throat> picking, that would be just totally impossible. At that kind of speed, I reckon you're right, you know, because uh, I couldn't find another way. Not to say that there aren't other ways. Guitar is full of techniques that have evolved. Uh, and, you know, sweep doesn't work for everything, just like uh, alternate doesn't work for everything. Tapping doesn't work. You know, whatever it takes to get the music out. You know, I learned a long time ago that it was more important what you play rather than how. Right? Because, you know, um, if guitar players can step out of their own uh, instrument and hearing their own instrument and putting themselves in the mindset of a keyboard player listening to you or a, or a horn player listening to a guitar player, um, they have no idea or care less what what technical uh, issues you're dealing with. Mm. You know, for horn players, it's reeds and you know, you know, dry or whatever. <clears throat> A pad might be sticking or something. Something's going on. Uh, you know, but I don't know anything about that. So I don't. You know, I just I'm listening to the horn player. What notes are you blowing, man? That's what I'm listening to. And ultimately, that's the most important thing. I remember when I first started uh, playing Chicks music <clears throat> um, in the electric band, I had to listen to a lot of live tapes with Scott Henderson on it. And we are completely different players. I mean, he, he does a lot of hammer-ons. Uh, you know, he'll pick one note and hammer on a couple, or whatever, you know. And he sounds great. So it's not, it wasn't, you know, to chick, he could care less how the notes are coming out, as long as the notes are coming out. You know, for me, I would, I, I'd take it upon myself to pick most things, you know. Uh, so with my technique, I'm able to pick a lot of the phrases that a lot of other guitar players have trouble with uh, because of the technique. It's a very liberating technique, uh, the, the Gambali sweep tick pick mm. technique. And so, um, you know, so the bottom line is the music first, the technique follows. And um, I was definitely influenced by uh, great horn players like Coltrane. I mean, he's so free. Uh, just, you know, um, Transition is one of my favorite records where he's just 
just blowing free, man. I just love the the recklessness of that record, you know. Uh, and so that was hugely influential on me. I just there's times where I, you know. Uh, I just want to be absolutely free to play and it could care less about anything else other than the, the high art of improvisation. I really consider it a very high art, you know. There's been enough brainwave studies on people's, uh, you know, jazz musicians or, or improvising musicians that the fireworks going on in your brain is unlike anything else. It's like 4th of July in your head. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it's a, it's a high art. It really is. Uh, it's not as appreciated uh, globally as much as some other things, you know, other kinds of music or whatever. But I still uh, love and cherish that high art, you know, and I got to do a lot of it in my lifetime, in my career, you know. A couple of records I've done where I just go, I, I don't care who's listening or or if it even sells a single copy, it's not the point. Um, I'm doing it because I, I need to be free to express my abilities, you know, without any hindrance of any kind, you know. So, uh, and, you know, and there's other records I'll make that are in the groove and, and, and you know, more mainstream, of course, you know. But, you know, I've done enough records. There was one that I was really channeling Coltrane was a, a, a record called um, Live Bootlegs, uh, Resident Alien Live Bootlegs. And it was just recorded with a DAT machine back in the day, but it was over a, about a span of a year and a half in the clubs in L.A. where we were experimenting and jamming a lot, you know. And some tunes are like 25 minutes long. It's just total free improvisation, you know, and um, so much fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've listened. I've listened to that recording a lot. Matter of fact, I was listening to that recording a lot when the idea occurred to me to do that presentation on Coltrane and guitar. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, let me make another point here, too. One thing that's very sad to me is, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of music critics and um, not many jazz musicians are, uh, but, you know, I always used to, I loved Chick for the very reason that he was one of these guys that was really open to the electric guitar and, and the power of the electric guitar when it was, you know, a melody, a soaring melody, or you know, guitar is a very powerful instrument in the right hands. Uh, tone wise and you know volume and it's sheer power it has a lot of power and you know i could be blowing a complete copy of a john coltrane solo and and most you know jazz purists will will hold their ears and go oh you know horrified at the electric guitar like a fusion guitar sound yet if it's played on a horn it's completely acceptable <laughs> the exact same notes you know to me that's tragic uh, that people are stuck in uh, some kind of thing with the timbre or the instrument rather than what's being played again you know <laughs> Yeah, it, it, a lot. yeah. The timbre thing is 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 an interesting. I mean, it's it, uh, it's totally a cultural thing because you mm -hmm. go to certain parts of the world and there are certain timbres that we probably wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't want to hear, and mm -hmm. that's just the regular timbre and, and everybody likes it. So it's it's not it's not a. Um, I mean, it's 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 totally a, it's totally a cultural thing. Yeah. So. You know, I was thinking about, um, so, okay, so I have a, I have a book out called How to Improvise Over Chord Changes. And oh. when I was um, in the sort of work for that book was actually I developed the curriculum for the improvisation sequence at Ohio State. And in the whole process of this, I, I have to tell you, in the back of my head, was pl was playing your chop builder video <laughs> okay um <laughs> this is why it's it's just beautiful that you talk about a piece of art that is a piece it's a it's a work of art okay <laughs> work of art because it it does a few things it really captures a certain time period 
it does a really good job of of catching a certain capturing a certain aesthetic the way it's filmed you know the way that people are dressed everything it it captures a certain time period but if people would actually do that what mm, it was oh, that you're it's timeless <laughs> yeah it's it's oh yeah it's 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 ridiculous it's ridiculous well, i just uh, funny you mentioned that because uh, on my online guitar school i just uh revamped that video really and yes brought it into the the current times you know uh digitized it and uh, also uh, did it in guitar pro and um you know and with backing tracks and all this stuff uh so it's actually been a popular seller on my my That's online great. school so it just goes on and on people love that because it's something they can follow and keep their well I tell you where I got the idea, right? I I don't know if you know the story, but at the time, I don't remember when it was. I guess it was the late eighties. Uh, um, Jane Fonda had the top five videos in America on Billboard. She was just killing it with her videos of aerobic exercise. And yeah. I love the idea of you know the way the groups were there moving up and down and doing the aerobics. And it was a progressive thing. There was the warm up and then there was, you know, the, the workout and then the cool down. I thought, shoot, man, somebody needs to do that for guitar. And it just hit me one day like a ton of bricks. And that's exactly what uh, inspired me to do that. Uh, concept and it's hugely popular and it's still popular today because it's absolutely uh, a monster workout if you can get from the beginning of that to the end you are a champion <laughs> yes absolutely but yeah. I, I started thinking to myself i was like man somebody's got to do this for other instruments uh, and there you go and, and although I didn't film it, what I did was I created all these exercises. Now, what that book does, How to Improvise Over Chord Changes, what it does is it focus, focuses on the blues progression um, and then as subsets, bird blues and minor blues and then rhythm changes. And then in the back, there are some common standards and common standard uh, um challenging standards uh you know like there's a there's a giant steps there's uh like stella by starlight but of course mm -hmm. i don't call them the exercises those names right you have to like no, I, I, I think uh uh pensativa is pensive yeah you yeah know? i did that too uh, <laughs> on a there was a record of mine called um natural high actually mm -hmm. the i did two trio records with this band um and I took standards, and it's a, it's an old thing. People have done this for years, uh, right back to uh, Parker and all those guys, uh, where they would take a, a standard chord progression and make their own melody on top of it, so they could blow those changes without having the, the copyright right, right. issue. You know, I have mm. one called "Have You Met Tom Jones," which cracks me up every time I say that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and you are all the things, you know, and. Um, yep. You know, I'll remember December, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. You know? And uh, so I wrote my own melodies to, to my favorite standard changes. And it was a really fun exercise, too, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a thing that's been done a lot. And it's a, it's a great idea. It's fun. It's oh, I understand getting around the copyright thing. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Coltrane took the contrafact concept to like the to the next step, right? Because what he does uh, with like a tune like a twenty six two, so he the bass is confirmation, but then he mm -hmm. superimposes the giant step substitution over confirmation, which creates a new sort of an original set of changes mm -hmm. and then he writes an original melody over it right. <laughs> it's like yeah there you go <laughs> it's layers man <laughs> yeah 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 uh C coltrane was such a oh goodness i i mean i could i, I can talk hours and hours about this dude he's been mm -hmm. such a powerful influence on the music on every aspect of it post coltrane yeah. has been irreversibly altered and you couldn't even get that stuff back in the bottle you know it was it's the done. time period you know it was really 
Yeah, he was an innovator and he covered all territories too. I mean, he went from smooth to, you know, I love that. That's why I like transition so much because that's when he started getting into the, the free, the free blowing part of his, his career. Uh, but yeah. he, he played, he could play mellow and beautiful and he could be as wi a real wild man at the same time, yeah. you know, and tear that horn apart. And uh, I love that's, free expression that's all you know that's all human expression all human emotion uh he covered it all and that's the best kind of artist one that can tap into all aspects of human emotion yes. and uh, another thing i wanted to mention is so uh uh th thunder from down under dr yeah. thunder <laughs> Hey, there we are. We're related right. somehow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't remember who dubbed me the Thunder from Down Under. I think it was an early, one of those early magazine articles, you know. And uh, and so it stuck, and I decided to call one of my records. There. I thought, that sounds good, Thunder from Down Under. Yep, that's me, you know, <laughs> being Australian. I feel so removed from Australia these days, but I do love, I still love it and, and miss it, but I, I rarely go there anymore. I, I you know, have uh, I'm born and raised there. I still have an affection for sure. <laughs> there you are. So, so you're, uh, you're in Barcelona now. I am. And uh, man, I have to say, I really, really love this city. I do love it a lot. It's funky and beautiful and so much art. Um, I'm a big Gaudi fan. You know, the, his architecture just blows my mind. I've been to many of his works. And, you know, Dali and, and Picasso, those cats are all Spanish. I just love Spain. I, I've been, you know, I've toured all over the world. I've been to a lot of countries, uh, most countries, uh, you know, more countries than most people ever go to in their lifetime. You know, I've been everywhere many times. And uh, I don't know, there's something about the Mediterranean. I just, you know, my parents are Italian and they immigrated to Australia. So... You know, I, I definitely have European uh, roots and upbringing just ground heavily into me, you know. So the Mediterranean, every time I came, I don't care whether it's Israel or, or Croatia or, you know, uh, the tip of Spain or Portugal or, or the south of France or Italy, it just there's something about the Mediterranean that's so beautiful. It's just drawn me in. So, you know, I've lived 40 years in America and I, I left in September um, and now I'm here. So I, it's a pretty rich life, you know, um, in terms of experience, you know, growing up in Australia, uh, leaving when I was about 22 and then 40 years in America. Uh, uh, almost 40 years and now here and I really dig uh, it's so chill here Spain you know it's um, it's easier you know I, mm. I love it I love it it's uh, it's very I feel so very relaxed here so it's cool it's big in it so uh you you have to own like a like a lot of guitars I'm sure you and, and a lot of gear okay so this is my <laughs> This is my question. Um, uh, so you moved recently. You moved now. Mm -hmm. Now I, I sort of know the answer to this, but how did you get all of that equipment, especially the guitars and the delicate nature of guitars, mm. from <laughs> moved well. to Barcelona? To be honest, man, it's not here yet. Uh, it oh, took us a okay. while. The, the, the home buying process here is very, very slow. And okay. The loan process is very, very slow. And me being a foreigner with my wife and, and my daughter, we, you know, they had to run a lot of stuff. And they, you know, a lot of bankers, they haven't a clue how musicians make money. <laughs> they really don't know. All they see on the tax return is a number. They go, well, where does this, where is it coming from? It's not a regular job, you know. And uh, musicians have uh, income from a lot of sources. So I had to really do a lot of explaining to these people to understand. 
and um, you know we sold our house and everything but uh, we've we finally found a beautiful uh, Spanish villa with the Mediterranean view and it's got a nice big casita that is going to be my next studio and we've only just sent this week sent away for our uh, you know we have two 40 foot containers coming over from LA <laughs> so it's a lot of boxes to unpack once it gets here you know and uh, you know it's a lot of guitars and stuff I, I, I decided not to sell everything you know I sold cars and stuff I didn't care about those but you know some of the guitars are very important to me and personal and uh, you know everything was shipped um, well it hasn't shipped yet but it's been you know my I have a grand piano a Yamaha C7 that is you know it's been completely crated everything's been uh, we picked a very uh, good shipping company that uh, was recommended to us by some friends that had done this kind of a move. It's a big move, you know, moving from one country overseas. It's a giant process. And yeah. I thought we'd be in a home by now in the home that we chose, you know, I thought we'd be in by March or even February. So, you know, it, things are slow, but it's finally moving. And uh, so we're very excited and, you know, it'll still take several months after that, you know, probably by the end of the year, we'll be still unpacking boxes, but, yeah. but it's all good. I love it here. You know, I have no complaints. And in, in the meantime, we've been staying in, in, the, in a nice apartment in Barcelona. And, you know, I step out of my, my door and, and we're in the thick of things here. There's bars, cafes, and uh, theaters, and, you know, lots of Gaudi stuff. And, you know, there's, it's incredible. Uh, they have bike trails every. It was a real pedestrian city, which I like. And they have bike trails running up and down the middle of the roads or on the sides. They're everywhere. And they have this company called Bicing, where uh, we've we've signed up. You pay seventy euros a year, and you get this card and an app. And you can take a bike. These racks are everywhere. So you take a bike and you ride it. And there's electric ones too, which are pretty cool as well. So you ride it anywhere you want in the city and you just find the next rack and you put it back in and then you walk to your, it's just great, you know, and the beaches here are really cool. So we've gotten to know the city pretty well now, uh, yeah. which has been beneficial because we're going to be about 25 minutes out of here uh, up in the get north of, of Barcelona. So my uh, my three favorite guitar players of all time, okay, um, Alan Holdsworth, Never George Benson, George Benson, yes, <laughs> and Frank Gambale. Ah, well, I'm uh, very yeah. happy to have made that list. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's facts too. That's 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 truth. I'm not I'm not blowing smoke at all. Um, well, you know, they're they're my favorite guitar players too. <laughs> you know, I love George. I always have, uh, and I love Alan. You know, and uh, you know, and there's many guitar players I admire. You know. Those two were standouts for me, you know, because of their uniqueness. I, I'm generally attracted to uh, real original sounding and, uh, you know, people with an original concept. And you would definitely have to say that about George and Alan. They were so unique. I mean, George is a jazz guitar player in the true sense of the word, uh, so, which is a steep tradition. It's a big tradition being that. But he, he was... Man, his sense of time and melody uh, and mm. phrasing is just unbelievable. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember the first time I saw George, I was um, 17 and I went, we drove four hours from my hometown, Canberra, to Sydney mm. to see him. Uh, and it was his original band with Jorge Dalto and Ronnie Foster and Stanley Banks. Uh, Harvey Mason, and man, they just destroyed me. They were just so good. I just could not believe what was coming out. And George was singing his tail off, you know? Yeah. All soul. That guy was all soul. And the keyboard players were brilliant. Just the whole thing. I remember coming out of the show going, my, my jaw was on the ground. I couldn't even speak. I was that stunned for hours. I just, I was 
totally absorbing this brilliant man, you know, and his incredible music, you know, and I, I had all his records, so I was listening, you know. So uh, it's interesting that Sydney would be the place that I would actually meet him for the first time. Um, I'll tell you a little story because I, uh, I guess it was about the early 90s, something like that. No. Uh, no, it was after my Thinking Out Loud record came out, which was uh, 1990. And that record, I had a, a GB10, George Benson uh, Ibanez guitar, which I still, it's my favorite jazz guitar in the entire world. I love it to pieces. And I like that one behind you too, that, uh, that Trini Lopez one. Uh, in that picture, that's an awesome. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's that's a very rare black one. You never see them. I think it's the only one. But uh, anyway, George heard that record and was completely knocked out. And fortuitously, I happened to be in Sydney with my band playing at a club called the Basement, and I was there for a whole week. And you know, I had no idea George was in town. And so I'm sitting in my room, we had a day off and I get a call and, and, you know, it's George, but I don't believe it. I think it's one of my mates who, you know, pulling my leg. Hey man, it's George. What are you doing? George Benson. I said, yeah, yeah. Pull the other one, man. I just don't believe this is George <laughs> Benson calling me out of the blue. <laughs> yeah, man, really? Look, I'm playing at the Hilton. You know, uh, we're doing the ballrooms, uh, you know, we start next week and, uh, you know, what are you doing? Come on over. I said, what? He says, I heard you thinking out re loud record. I want to go through the whole thing with you. I said, what? I said, you got to be kidding me. Anyway, I, I, you know, bit the bullet and I went, okay, it really must be him. So I pile over to the, to the Hilton. He has the whole 35th floor or something to himself. It's pretty cool. And, um, you know, some other people that usher me in and there he is. I, I get to meet the great George Benson and we hung out and we were eating sushi and, you know, this incredible view of the whole of Sydney. And he's, pointing out everything that he liked on my thinking out loud record just one bit of, oh listen to that one Ooh, that one you know that oh you know he was incredible to me i went wow you know that's really beautiful coming from you man if, if anyone uh you know can compliment you uh it would be one of your heroes and and that was and he was so gracious and and such a beautiful soul he still is you know i i run into him all the time and i i always give him the biggest hug man i love him to pieces and so um you know, and then he invites me to his show, uh, which I went to uh, at one of the ball, the ballroom at the Hilton. And he made me stand up. He says, man, you know, I didn't know who he was talking about. You know, he was going, there's, you know, there's an Australian that you guys really need to acknowledge, you know, guitar player. And, and he made me stand up uh, and take an applause from his audience. Mm. It was really, truly special to me. And then after that, he came to my show and he got there really early took a table, one of the better tables. I didn't know any of this. He was, he came and he sat through both shows and right up to the end and then came backstage uh, after the show. So he really wanted to hear it live. And, um, you know, we've been friends ever since. I love the man and great. It's a great honor to have, you know, to know him and to, uh, you know, I wish we'd get to play one of these days, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know, a couple of years ago, and I'll tell you, with this pan with this pandemic, it, it has thrown off my sense of time, like majorly. Like, um, what day is it? Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Groundhog <laughs> Day. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so, so, something like Groundhog Day. No, mm. but it 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 just uh, when I reflect back and I think back about a certain time period, usually there are a lot of gigs and things that are populating the space. Mm -hmm. So that gives me a certain impression of how long ago something was. Right. But this last, you know, year has seemed like 
so long. It seems like it's been five years or something. Yeah. You know. Um. But uh. But anyhow, maybe this was three years ago. It was a few years ago. Uh. So you know, because Alan Holdsworth passed away not not too long ago. I, I was um, at his service, man. It was a very sad day. Yeah. I saw you. Uh. You were playing a gig at the Nam Show. And there's a YouTube video where uh, whoever's He's taking watching. the video. I'm yeah. sorry. Alan's watching, right? Yeah, yeah Alan's watching. Yeah. Yeah, and that was, um, you know, uh, it that made me it made me smile uh, to to see that because um, of how much uh, you know I love both of your playing and and just to see him. The whole time, all the way up into the end, he is stretching for something else, pulling for something else, checking everybody out, you know, so um, he, he, you know, I never met him, but in everything that I've seen, he's, he just seems to be so uh, like warm and like inquisitive and like, you know, checking stuff out. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, you know, uh, Alan was a very sweet man, very gentle, a gentle giant. And, um, you know, I got to make one record with him, that Truth and Shredding album, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I was asked to produce it, and uh, I chose all the material, which was largely covers, you know, Brecker Brothers and, um, you know, uh, some Wayne Shorter stuff and, you know, uh, even a chick tune, I think we did Humpty Dumpty, and I did one original tune. But, uh, you know, we recorded live, and then Alan uh, was a little intimidated by, you know, that kind of a situation where, you know, he didn't read music, so he felt a little uncomfortable. So we, and I think he was also busy. He was on the road or the scheduling didn't work out. But so he he was really excited to do it, but he said, can I do it? I'll overdub my parts. So that's what we did. We left him space to blow. And, uh, but I did get to mix with him, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> we, uh, you know, he was a serious tweaker when it came to tone. You know, uh, he brought his Massenberg uh, uh, preamps in and really did a lot of dialing. But, you know, I, I knew Alan before that, too. The first time I met him was, was uh, on my first electric band tour, which was in the summer of 86. And I'm a complete unknown playing with Chick Corea and the electric band. And guess who's opening for us every night? It was Alan Holsworth, you know, with Chad Wackerman and Jimmy Johnson. And, you know, that was rough that was rough for me i was only 26 at the time uh and to have to go on after alan <laughs> and play with chick you know it was a stressful uh stressful but beautiful um tour i remember it quite well but you know alan was very self-deprecating you know he always thought his he sucked or he was horrible and it was complete madness because he's nothing but genius and you know i remember the electric band you know we'd all be on the wings watching his performance uh from the side of the stage and you know he'd come off the stage and he says i'm very sorry you had to hear that you know th things like that i go oh man that was incredible you guys were amazing and you go oh i don't think so you know and you know, after about 10 nights of this we all started going well okay let's just see what happens if we agree with him and so uh you know he'd come off the stage very sorry you had to hear that and we go oh yeah that sucked man that was the worst crap i ever heard in my life just horrible and he broke into laughter and <laughs> it was like it broke the ice you know he went oh okay <laughs> i know what you guys are coming from. you know because it was brilliant no one played anything like him his chordal uh, work you know everybody talks about his linear stuff which was out of this world but his his chord sense i mean he he did a lot of uh, chord melody you know and it's rocket science. I remember just, you know, being in the studio when we were mixing Truth and Shredding and 
you know, being right next to him. I'm like two feet away from him, watching him voice chords. And I just said, how the heck are you doing that? How do you go from one chord to another? Cause he was doing stuff like this. I can't play the voicings, but he would, you know, have these two notes, the low two notes and the two top notes, you know, he'd pull chords like that all the time, one after another, bing, bang, bang, bong, you know, and I went, this, this guy is mad. He's just impossible. You know, he just worked it out. You know, uh, every kind of voicing you could ever possibly imagine on the guitar, he played them. And it was like Schoenberg, man. He was just incredible. Uh, his musicality. You know, he was he he was self-deprecating because, uh, you know, he never really learned to read. And that sort of inhibited his ability to really work with a lot of others. You know, that's why. Uh, well, he did a lot in the early days, but certainly later in life, he, he really just did his own thing, which is great. Uh, and a lot of brilliant records came out of him, uh, but not a lot of work with others, sadly, you know. And so I was very pleased to, to have him agree to do the Truth in Shredding album at all because he wasn't comfortable, you know. And, uh, it was a lot of standard tunes and kind of fusion chord progressions. Uh, which were, uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, there was no problem with him playing it. Yeah, I knew he could do do it, and, and he did it so amazingly well, um, you know, which was good, uh, you know, to bring him in, because I wanted to hear him play over kind of chords that I could understand, you know. <laughs> that was one of the things I, that really motivated me. He says, man, I just want to him, hear him play over an F7, you know. What the heck would he do? And, uh, you know... The album says it all. It's just brilliant, you know. Brilliant. But you know what was weird about the contract for that record is uh, Mark Varney, the guy who put up the money for the record, uh, brother of Mike Varney, the shredder guy. Uh, Mark Varney was a fusion freak, and his two favorite guitar players were Alan Holsworth and me. <laughs> and so his his dream was to put us together, and so he, he really... But he said, look, I love the solos. He, he, he just wigged out over the solos all the time. He, he was just, he would go into some sort of trance. And he, you know, he, he, he stipulated on the contract that each solo from Alan and I had to be three, at least three minutes long on every track. I mean, and I don't, I don't usually sit around and you know just look at my watch when I'm playing a solo, so I had to you know I had to time the choruses and and you know make sure it was over three minutes, otherwise we would have been in breach of contract. I mean, how many contracts do you see like that nowadays? Your solos must be at least three minutes long. <laughs> the songs are only three minutes. What are you talking uh, about? That's right. You know, yeah, it wasn't you know it wasn't a pop record. And that's for sure. <laughs> that's <laughs> I great. love being on the outside sometimes, you know. I just, you know, I don't care about the commercial side of, of, of mm. I don't care about award shows. I don't really care much about that. Be, you know, music is not a contest. It's just not sport. It's not something somebody won this award. Really? I mean, there's, you know, I remember uh, when Steely Dan won uh, Album of the Year for Two Against Nature at the Grammys. And to me, that was absolutely staggering that they won because I find them to be, you know, very high art. Their, their music is yeah. just incredible. And so... You know, they were up against Eminem and Britney Spears and a whole other host of, you know, well-known household names. And I'm sure they were looking at these two crusty guys that went up to pick up the award and going, who are they? <laughs> who the hell are they? Uh, not having any clue of their rich heritage. But, uh, but the point I was going to make was that before the Grammys, uh, the, the record came out about a month or two before uh, the Grammys uh, before the nominations. And, you know, I was first in line to buy a copy. Uh, I remember standing up front of Tower Records going down to buy it. Two Against Nature, brilliant record. And 
you know, I'm a fan, obviously, and I, I bought it when the day it came out. And I think it was selling like 5,000 copies a week. It wasn't a big seller. Uh, it was steady, you know, and all the Steely Dan fans were buying it. But when it won album of the year, it went from 5,000 a week to 50,000 a week. And I'm thinking, yeah. you know, it's like... It, it was the same album before, yeah. you know, uh, it's like sometimes uh, one needs to be told what's good or something, you know, I don't yeah, know. It, it, it I, gives, I'm just confused by the whole thing. Well, it gives you an indication of uh, why the record companies um, have set up this competition sort of system. Mm. Um, uh, it's just for, for the reason that you just said, I mean, if, if it wins, then it's, oh, it's legitimate now. So then that, that means now everybody can go and, um, you know, be hip and own it, Yeah, you know, just because it won or yeah. hopefully because they like the music, but you know, I get it. Yeah, right. I know it's a business, you know, I've never been a big fan of music business, you know? Right. I adore music. I live and breathe music uh, in all its wonder, wonderful forms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I honor music. Uh, it's what I live for. Uh, but I don't honor and live for the music business at all, I must say. Yeah, me neither. And it's, it's an unfortunate byproduct that we have to pay attention to it. It's not to say that I'm not aware of it. And, you know, and, and now with social media and keeping up with all the social media trends and, and promoting in my own way, you know, I don't need to sell a million copies. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm never going to go for that because it's just, yeah, as a jazz musician, it's unlikely. Some people have broken through that barrier as jazz musicians, George being one of them, you know, like what, what is Breezen up to like 15 million now? Something like that, you know. Be something like that, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, um, George's singing is just as wonderful as his guitar playing. He's double dipped as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, you know, um, I'm happy that people are listening. That's what I care about. And I, you know, I build up my following and I have my loyal fans and I'm really happy with that, you know, and it's a steady growing thing too. The social media thing is very good. I, I'm, I'm delighted that I can go tap exactly straight to my audience now with nothing in the middle right? No one's in the middle. And in, in a way, that's one of the best things about the internet. And it's brought my global fans together. And it's brilliant. Uh, my online school, you know, people are tapping in from all over the world. And, um, and so it's a beautiful thing. You know, I can, I can teach exactly as I wish to teach. Uh, my courses are exactly as I would teach them. And I don't have to filter them for, for, for whatever reason. I've been mm -hmm. head of, ahead of the guitar department at LA Music Academy for 10 years um, as a, a boutique kind of school. But, you know, uh, having to deal with administration and all that stuff, I found rather challenging. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, well, uh, I'm, I don't know. I have to explain that to you. I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, but I you know, that. so that's why I started my online school because I want to yeah. be able to teach exactly how I see it, and for better or worse, you know, I think uh, I have ways to teach people that you know may reach um, uh, into uh, their brains in a way that they get it. You know, the whole point of teaching uh, at all is for the comprehension. A person has to really receive the information and understand it uh, without that you're not really teaching so you know finding ways to facilitate that is what i'm all about finding the easiest way not only to play something but the easiest way to teach something that gets across so yeah that and you know still making music still writing still uh still enjoying the whole process of music. But, you know, we were talking about this COVID situation. You know, for me, it's been a blessing in a lot of ways. You know, I've been on the road pretty hard for the last 35 years, 36 years. And, you know, it's been just wonderful having this time off, I must say. You know, it's the longest time I've spent with my family, and we've grown so much closer 
Uh, I've, you know, I feel really healthy. I'm ready to go back on the road. My tours keep getting postponed by a year. It's crazy. Uh, you know, I had a March, April tour that I canceled one day before all the COVID thing hit uh, back last year. And then it was supposed to happen this year. And of course it's been postponed to 2022 and hopefully not 2023, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, and it, but it, you know, I have to see the the, the blessing uh, that COVID has been uh, on the amount of time that I have now, the time to do other things that I've enjoyed too. So uh, it's in that in that sense, it's been cool. Yeah, a lot of the artists that I've interviewed uh, have said a similar kind of thing. You know, folks that are touring all the time. It's just nice to be able to spend time with family. And um, though uh, it can be challenging for for maybe artists that aren't as, establ as established oh, yeah. and don't have other sure. things that they can do to make income, mm -hmm. um, it at least has given folks an opportunity to... Um, to rest. Yeah. yeah, I definitely feel rested. That's for sure. I, feel like I just, you know, I just did a full physical the other day. And, you know, my doctor says I have the blood of a 20 year old, you know, uh, which is you know, it's clean living for you, man. No drugs, no drinking, no nothing, no smoking. And I feel great. And so I, I you know, I, I value my health now more than anything as a, a 62 year old man, you know, the health without your health and facility, you don't have much, you know, so it's, it's, as you get older, it becomes more of a priority. And, you know, I want to be able to play guitar long into my future, you know, yeah. and fortunately the technique that I have too, with the sweeping, it, it's so less stressful. Uh, and I don't have any carpal uh, situation at all. Mm. And so it's it's been a gift, really, uh, to have that facility, you know, the speed without having to stress about it, you know, or tense about it, you know, be tense. So I, I, I just had uh, one more question, and then I want to give you a chance to plug any whatever you want to plug. Um, okay. So my question is about Chikoria. Never heard of him. Um, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he passed away recently, and oh, yeah. uh, it's been, it was kind of devastating blow. Yes. Um, and... Uh, you played with him, I mean, obviously in the electric band. Uh, so when when did you first meet him and start playing with him? And then when was the last time you played with him? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I I also played in uh, Return to Forever for the whole of 2011, which was also an incredible um, experience for me. So yeah, I, I joined Chick in 20. What am I saying? No, 1986 uh, to the present, pretty much. Um, you know, uh, I met him in an audition that I did for the, you know, for the guitar chair. And, uh, you know, I played like it was my last performance on earth. And, uh, you know, he, it took one song and he jumped off of, off of the piano and came over to me and says, oh, your amp is going to be facing kind of 45 degrees off the stage. And, uh, and I thought, wow, I got the gig already. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, he'd already made up his mind, you know, he'd never heard anything like it. Uh, and, you know, obviously I was a, a good fit because I was a big fan of his since I was 13, transcribing all his stuff. And um, so he must have heard a lot of himself in me, you know, and, and clearly heard some influence. Um, yeah, and like we toured all over the world. It was an incredible experience and such a great man, such an honorable and gracious man he was. His music, uh, you know, having played his music for so many years, it was always challenging and fun. You know, sometimes it there was stuff on the paper I'd never seen before, <laughs> you know. Uh, there were some re remarkable challenges musically. Uh, I, I reflect on some of the tunes, like um, I remember Tale of Daring from the Inside Out record. Uh, it's about a 20-minute 20 mi 20 piece of music, I think. And it was some 32 pages long, and it was just 
I, I recall getting the demo. He would always make a little uh, demo so we could hear kind of how it went. And uh, thinking to myself, I'm never going to learn this in a million years. You know, <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to take me forever, you know. But as the Chinese proverb goes, a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So, you know, step by step, I would piece it together. And, you know, I remember playing that tune live and people were just there. It was sh stunned and, and, and just in awe of that composition. It's amazing. And same with, you know, things like uh, I really love the two, the stars record too. You know, we came back after a 10 year hiatus to make that record. And there's some incredible music on that record. Uh, the opening track is is like bar talk on on speed man it's just <laughs> it is a crazy piece called uh check blast and uh it, there's nothing i've ever heard anyone play that's like that composition and i remember there was it that was the only time i ever came across a part the chick had written that i couldn't play and only because of where it was uh pitch wise i said chick this this arpeggio uh, and it's so fast and so heavy and all up right from the bottom of the neck to the top. Um, you know, I said, I can't do it where it is, but if I play it up a third, I, I, I found a way to do it. And so we ended up playing because the th there's a lot of themes inside that, um, that song that is thirds based, like augmented and uh, whole tone kind of thing. So I thought if I play it in thirds, it, it, and he said, yeah, sure, yeah, whatever it takes to play it, you know, and, and so we ended up playing it in harmony, which made it even more amazing, <laughs> I thought, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of his compositions were, you know, with, with Chick, it was always something really, really easy and fun and a, a magic carpet ride to play easy. And then the other extreme of just crazy complex and hard you know uh, there wasn't a lot in between it was one or the other would check uh i think that's his gemini nature <laughs> he's mm. uh, yin yang and uh and you know the last time we played together was in um, tokyo at the tokyo jazz festival although i played with him tokyo jazz festival was the summer uh, i think august 1st uh, 2019. And then, uh, I actually played with him. Um, I think, uh, somewhere in the middle of 2020, he had this, uh, video release of, um, um, a documentary that he'd done and he had this big event and a lot of people came to see the, uh, you know, they screened it and he asked if I'd play there and I jammed with Vinnie Caliuta and uh, Carlito del Puerto and uh, Hubert Law sat in too and Chick. It was fun. And so we played 500 Miles High and a couple other of, of his standards that night. So that was the last time I played with him. Uh, you know, uh, there is an electric band live record that we were in the middle of uh, when he died. Um, he'd already chosen all the tunes and um, he had written one new song, which we all did. Uh, so there is a new electric band song. Uh, in the future horizon. And I think it's going to be like a three LP. I think they're going to do it on LP three LP set. Um, I don't know if they're going to digitize it or what, or whether it'll be on CD anymore, if anyone's buying CDs, but uh, so that's coming uh, with this live extra track uh, with not a live extra track, but a studio track that we all did independently. And we all made independent videos that, I think they're going to make some kind of collage. Um, and so that's, that's really going to be probably the last electric band, anything, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we had all sorts of plans. We were going to do a really wonderful documentary on the electric band too, which never came to pass and a lot more touring. You know, we had tour dates for 2020 that were canceled. You know, they kept getting pushed forward. 
So there were plans to play, but they never they never happened, sadly, and now they won't ever happen. So yeah, sad. You know, I miss him already. He was an incredible guy, and uh, I'm I'm very proud to be part of his rich legacy. Um, you know. It was an honor to play with him. Uh, you know, whenever the phone would ring and it was Chick, I'd go, I don't care what it is. I just said yes. <laughs> and I said, sure, of course I'll play, man. I, yeah. No hesitation whatsoever. I just loved his his whole thing, the, yeah. the organization. My own tours were a lot harder work, I'll tell you. You know, mm. being band leader is not not an easy task, you know, when it, all the responsibilities on you and, you know, with Chick, it was always beautiful accommodations, beautiful travel, easy. I never had to lift a finger with, in terms of gear, uh, you know, it's as it should be. Uh, and so, you know, it was always a beautiful experience. It's just purely all about the music, you know, Great. Wow. As, as it should be. That was great, man. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, what would you like to plug? <laughs> so I, I heard you you said you said something about uh, the sort of uh, you you sort of redid the uh, chop builder thing. Yeah, I've done new versions of some of my old stuff. I'm 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 putting it back together, but you know I have my online school, frankenballyguitarschool dot com, uh, which has been you know just a tremendous resource for musicians. Um, you know, there's all kinds of courses. There's one called Spicing Up the Blues, which is a ten hour video course. The Gambali Sweet Picking Technique, which is another ten hour video course. You know, they come with all the standard stuff like Guitar Profiles, which are really it's a great app guitar pro enables you to slow things down or loop bars or you know um without changing the pitch and all that stuff uh, and backing tracks and all you know and then i did uh when i was head of the guitar school at uh la music academy i wrote a one-year uh course on uh harmony and theory and and i released it as an 18-hour video course uh uh, one year program became an 18 hour video course called peace and harmony. And cause I want people to come to peace with learning harmony and theory. You know, a lot of people, especially guitar players are a bit you know, scared of theory, but you know, it is really the, it's the, it's the fountain. It's really is the place where you learn what you need to know. And, and it's so inspirational to, to hear and, and explore all the different sounds that are possible. And I've released quite a number of courses. Another one, Pentatonic Heaven, which is, you know, how to play pentatonics everywhere and on anything, any chord. I did one called Rhythmic Displacement, which I find very fascinating subject. You know, instead of the dugga 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 you know, I call Chinese water torture, where you're heavy on the downbeats all the time. Mm -hmm. It's nice to break it up uh, into other rhythmic possibilities. So I did a whole course on that. I think I've hit all the courses. I can't think of anything else. There may be more, but you know, I have a whole bunch of stuff too, transcriptions and it's, it's a growing school and, um, yeah, and well-received and the students love it. And uh, so I highly recommend that I've got new music coming. I've got a whole, uh, you know, catalog of albums. If you've missed anything, oh, yeah. you should go and have a listen, of course. And um, yeah, look, I, I love to tap into both being the artist musician and uh, you know with all this time off i've had a chance to write some pretty cool music which i plan to release soon and uh, some additional courses that i'm working on i'm working on one called uh, playing outside you know i did a little survey with my students i uh, i you know did an email blast and i said what is it you want to learn from me what's next and so i got a whole flood of uh, suggestions and a lot of the time was playing outside. You know, I'd always say, guys, you know, you make a lot more money playing inside as a musician. <laughs> so you sure you want to travel down that road? I have a lot of concepts for playing outside. And uh, okay, you know, so that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, and triad heaven to follow up pentatonic heaven you know they're using triads everywhere um i want to do one on my gambali tuning <clears throat> at some point soon too 
Um, plus a whole bunch of improv. People are asking me for improv ideas too. Just like, you know, that's something you're tapped into too. I mean, improv is a pretty vast subject, you know, and there's lots of approaches, lots of ways to do it. And um, so, yeah, I'll be doing a course of that, that as well in the future. God willing. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's great, man. I will link your website to the description of this video so people can quickly and easily find you. And um, uh, thanks so much for doing this interview. I had a blast. I hope you had a good time, too. I certainly did, Sean. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. All right. Well, God bless you. God bless you, too. Ciao. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.